So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, we've been very proud to kick off a, um, an exciting week of events leading up to the IMF World Bank meetings. We hope, while not potentially necessarily as influential, we hope to be slightly more provocative and open and have a good discussion. Uh, yesterday we had uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew in the morning. Today, so far, we had uh, former Bundesbank President, UBS Chairman Axel Weber, and then Chinese Vice Minister Finance Xu. And everybody we've been having has been circling around a few very big issues, obviously the growth issue. But within the growth issue, the question very strongly about roles roles of new institutions, roles of old institutions, uh, what constitutes responsible behavior of the richer countries towards the poorer in the context of investment development, uh, what can be done in the field of public infrastructure and how we should be financing it, and of course, the I'm willing to use the word failures of the US government to deliver on its commitments to reform governance of the international financial architecture, particularly the IMF and the World Bank. And so in that context, we are particularly honored and pleased to have with us two of the leaders of multilateralism in the world today, uh, Sir Suma Chakrabadi, President of the European Bank of Reconstruction for Reconstruction Development, and President Donald P. Kabaruka, please forgive my pronunciation, uh, as President of the African Development Bank. Um, I will just give a little bit more bio about them and then ask them each to speak. Sir Suma has prepared a speech that we will also make available on the website to all everyone who is watching um, for later download and, and Donald Kabruka has also prepared to engage. We will follow that with just some opening commentary and remarks from two close colleagues of mine and of ours who are extensively experienced in this area. One is Professor Simon Johnson of MIT, who is also a non-resident senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute. Simon, of course, was chief economist at the IMF from 2007 to 2008, and in that critical period was far from, from shy about making clear uh, the ways in which uh, previously dominant governance was not necessarily functioning well, and he's continued to be an outspoken advocate for a, a better functioning international system since leaving the IMF. We also have with us Dr. Domenico Lombardi, who is director of the Center for International Governance Innovations Global Economy Program, CG. Uh, we're very proud this is the third event where we've partnered with CG and with Domenico's program specifically. As we put out in a news release, we're also very proud that CG has seen fit to fund a work on reforming central banks around the world, um, a project that I'll be leading with colleagues here, which we hope is another instance of trying to make better policy and better governance, and we appreciate their emphasis on innovation. Just to remind you that Domenico was of course, a member of the Financial Times Forum of Economists, previously was a senior scholar across the street at Brookings, and an executive board member at the IMF. But first, Please allow me to introduce Sir Suma Chakrabarti. He's been president of the EBRD since 2012. Previously, he was permanent secretary of the British Ministry of Justice and head of the UK's Department of International Development. As many of you know, and I don't think I'm being partisan, um, DFID, the, the, the UK Department of International Development, has been seen quite rightly as one of the model agencies in, in the world, and it's very great to have had Sir Suma's contributions there. He previously worked at the US Treasury, and the I mean, UK Treasury, excuse me, in the Cabinet Office. And with that, I'd like to invite Sir Suma to take the stage. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let, me, let me start by thanking the Peterson Institute and uh, its president, Adam Posen, for hosting us this evening. Uh, it's actually a great honor for me to share the stage uh, with such an accomplished lineup of uh, discussants. Uh, particularly, um, it's nice for me to share the stage with Donald Kabaruka. Donald's now in his last year as uh, president of the African Development Bank. And probably, Donald, this is one of the few occasions I'm going to have uh, before you finish your second term there to say thank you for what you've done uh, for international development and fortunately you'll be carrying on doing that I'm sure afterwards as well but it's been a great pleasure to work with you over all these years. 
Um, my starting point is that those who care about multilateral institutions, their owners, their managers, need to really think afresh. Uh, I speak as someone who's been on, I guess, the three sides of the equation, if you can be on three sides of an equation. Uh, first, uh, from my time immediately after university, when I actually worked for the Botswana government. Uh, that was my first experience uh, of being a, working for a recipient country, uh, if you like. Then, uh, as Adam said, uh, from my time as a shareholder when I was in DFID in the UK government, and now uh, from within a multilateral as uh, president of EBRD. Now, there's nothing unique in those experiences. Uh, my friends Donald and others who are heads of uh, other regional development banks can also claim uh, the same sort of experience. Uh, but I do think, even though I'm speaking just for myself tonight, the experience of having been on uh, in these different roles does give the, us a bit of a vantage point in, in debates on the multilateral system. And the need for fresh thinking amounts, in my view, to two, I guess, key observations that are the subject of my talk tonight. First, I believe that there is a bias against change in the multilateral system uh, that makes us slower than we should be uh, to respond to shifting needs and opportunities. I don't say that we don't respond, we do, but it's probably more slowly than I and others would like. And secondly, applying that observation to regional development banks like the EBRD, we too, I think, could develop a much faster reaction time uh, and catch waves as they're rising rather than usually as they're falling. And I go on in this speech to say something about lessons learned from the EBID experience uh, and also on a new agenda, just giving some examples of how regional development banks can become more effective if we listen and respond to the voices of our clients much more closely than now. Now, existing multilateral institutions and many of their key sh shareholders, in my experience, always question the need for new multination bodies. It was the same, actually, when EBRD was uh, first created, and I was involved in, as a young uh, desk officer in those days. Uh, but it was the same when also we more recently expanded our mandate to North Africa. Whatever the source of new demands, whether it comes from regional political forces or special interest groups, uh, they have one thing in common, a belief that the international system is somehow not meeting their needs today. And the unwillingness and inability of existing players to change and to adapt quickly to meet shifting demand always leaves the multilateral system, in my view, playing catch up. Now, I'm sure that when the Inter-American Inter Development Bank, the Asian and African Development Banks were set up in response to calls for greater regional empowerment than a global body could perhaps help to meet, there was no doubt disquiet amongst uh, a number of major shareholder capitals. And I know, because I've actually seen the documents in the National Archives in the UK, that uh, when the EBRD was originally conceived by President Mitterrand, uh, there were those who asked, well, why couldn't existing institutions just do the job? Uh, Mitterrand's answer, and I think this is quite interesting coming from a French socialist, uh, was, uh, was right in my view. The existing institutions did not know Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union any better. Uh, were not focused on the creation of market economies as a main spur to development, and did not have the political mandate of supporting only those countries committed to democracy and pluralism. And I know there was disquiet among some shareholders of the EBRD when it was suggested that we take our experience and skills to Northern Africa in the wake of the Arab Spring. And I feel sometimes it's the same uh, play again today with the creation of the BRICS or the New Development Bank and the mooted Asia Infrastructure Fund. And the creation of these new bodies is, in my view, an implicit criticism of the existing international system as being too slow to adapt to the shifting geopolitical power structures, but, and also too slow to development needs of emerging economies. Now, if the system is slow to respond or downright hostile to the creation of new multilateral institutions, then it's also sometimes slow to allow existing bodies to adapt their focus, their practices, and their approach in shifting needs on the ground. Partly because some shareholders are not close enough, frankly, to the action on the ground to fully grasp how demand and priorities are changing. But partly, and I have to own up to this, partly also because of vested interests 
and incentives within the existing institutions to keep doing more of the same. The new is often inconvenient and always seems much more risky. Uh, and partly also, I have to say, because some of the changes, as Donald and I know all too well, may require changes in the constitutions of the multilateral institutions, and those changes are painful to bring about and time-consuming to agree uh, among the many shareholders. There, there is, therefore, in my view, an innate bias against rapid change in all of our institutions. And a good example of the result of this bias is actually, I think, the creation of very specialized institutions in health or climate change in the last decade and a half. If the existing bodies don't change quickly enough, then the specialized interest groups and others will quickly shift to try and create new ones to fill the space. Now, we in EBRD have had to shake off the conservative bias at various points when it comes to what we do and where we do it. Our geographic remit has widened, and the original instruments and focus of EBRD activities have shifted over time from supporting privatization and offering uh, pre-privatization investment uh, at the early stages of transition in economies with very large state sectors to focusing much more on sub-sovereign lending to municipal companies to improve utility services, improving access to finance for SMEs, financing sustainable energy projects and local capital market development, and more recently and interestingly supporting private healthcare investment and access to finance for female entrepreneurs. Now, at each stage, although, of course, the organization has successfully moved on, there has been, frankly, an internal struggle, and one with some of our shareholders, uh, to validate the need for any change at all. It has required the su support of some key shareholders, and I have to pr uh, praise the US in this. The US has often been very prominent in, in these debates in helping us to change. It's required the support of key shareholders and some senior managers who combine vision with extraordinary reserves of, of patience to take on those, I caricature, but not a lot, those who say that EBRD does not need to change, that EBRD was perfect in 1991, the world uh, as we understood it then, and doesn't really need to shift. The battle over EBRD, whether EBRD should involve itself in projects in which inclusion, in particular gender, play, play a part, is a recent case in point. All the research we've ever seen shows that inclusion is an important part of developing the market economy, the heart of EBRD's mandate. But it was an internal and external struggle to establish that EBRD should involve itself in such projects at all. So I start with a general appeal, a general appeal to the owners and managers like me of multilateral institutions. We need to be much more open to responding rapidly to demand from our clients, recipient countries, or in our case, partner companies, entrepreneurs, and much less prone to just keeping things as they are. What does this appeal mean for the regional development banks going forward? Well, let me address this from the viewpoint of EBRD's experience. What lessons have we in EBRD learned that might be useful to a debate about the future of regional development banks, or RDBs, as we often call them? One thing we learned is that moving into new arenas and being successful in them required that we look carefully at what the recipient countries need and what we can bring to the table and where our particular value-added lies relative to other institutions. For example, when EBRD was asked by its shareholders to expand operations in uh, Mongolia, Turkey, and later North Africa, uh, we knew we were moving into territory where other institutions had more local knowledge, well-developed relationships, and experience. There was no sense in us trying to replicate the work that they did, and our shareholders, in the end, weren't really asking us to. But at the same time, we needed to leverage the experience of our peer institutions on the ground. So first, we cooperated very closely with those who knew the territory well. The African Development Bank and the Islamic Development Bank were both generous and instrumental in sharing their expertise and knowledge with us as we worked to get up to speed in our new countries of operation in North Africa. And second, we differentiated our work by focusing on our private sector business model. This is a labor-intensive relationship building model. It bears fruit only after a great deal of effort is put into studying the local market, undertaking due diligence, and meeting clients one at a time. We didn't suggest we should get into budget support, which would have been a quick way of increasing our investment levels and showing we're really taking off in North Africa. It wouldn't have been true to our, uh, what we're good at. And anyway, others can do that sort of thing better than us. The exercise also gave rise, I think, to a central observation, one that, again, is all too rare, but is a central point here. The lens through which we should approach a new agenda for the RDBs 
is that of the recipient countries. That is the correct lens, in my view. It's the demand side rather than the supply side which ought to be in the driving seat. It's re recipient countries where priorities are recognized and defined, and the multilateral system should tailor itself more flexibly so it delivers better on those priorities. Now, the geographical division of the RDBs is clear. It's very well understood. And it, in my view, it can be a great strength of the multilateral system. Focusing our operations on a targeted region allows us to ground our work in a robust local presence, nurture long-term relationships, and know our markets so that we can offer much greater value to clients and, and donors and effectively engage policymakers. But less appreciated, perhaps, outside of the institutions themselves, uh, except in recipient countries, is how this geographic division and the differences in mandate and ownership of the multilateral banks give rise to different niches of expertise. We each have very different and complementary sets of skills. Our regions present their own challenges and have helped to shape our abilities. Some of our institutions have particular expertise in operating in fragile and conflict-affected states. The ADB does in the African Development Bank. Others have spent time developing innovative mechanisms to reach the rural poor or instruments for bottom of the pyramid entrepreneurs. Some are experienced in local capital markets development, financing, engineering, and, uh, and structured products. Others have invested in incubators or innovation or higher risk experimentation, pushing the boundaries of how we operate. If that's the picture of our different skill sets, how can we maximize our impact? What would recipient countries, who are less interested, frankly, in territorial behavior, and more interested in utilizing those skills to best effect on the ground, what would they want the regional development banks to do? And a lifetime of working with these recipient countries suggests an agenda for change for the RDBs. And I start with a point of, from a point of principle, actually. I believe that most recipient countries are less hung up on geographical boundaries between the regional banks than are the main owners and some of the managers. The recipients I speak to would say that in certain circumstances, these skills and tools and pockets of deep, specialized expertise should be shared across our regions. That's how a global enterprise would operate across regional divisions in response to demand. But even though the regional MDBs have many of the same owners, we actually find it difficult to achieve this. Right now, the boundaries to those exchanges are often forbidding, and we struggle to identify viable mechanisms to tap into one another's expertise horizontally. And that's not simply a question of better coordination. It is about building into our existing geographic architecture the selective cross-cutting mechanisms that allow more flexible skills-based architecture. Why does it matter? Well, really, because the needs of our recipient countries that they're tackling now are not the ones that have been envisaged when we were all set up. We're grappling as a global community with climate change, with the particular development challenges of middle-income countries, still pockmarked with large uh, areas of extreme poverty, with high youth unemployment, with the complex task of channeling education into innovation, countless municipalities, for example, in need of functioning utilities and modern IT infrastructure. And we're grappling with all of this at a time of even scarcer public resources. The same geographic division that has helped MDBs to be so effective in their markets and to hone tools to tackle some of these challenges in my view, also hinders us from sharing those tools horizontally when they're needed. We need to make better use of what we have, and we need mechanisms beyond working groups and coordination to tap into one another's expertise. Surely that's how a recipient country would organize the multilateral system if it had its way. So let me give some examples of what, examples of what we in EBRD have been developing and what we see as potential for how the multilateral system, particularly the regional development banks, might respond better to uh, demand. These ideas are grounded in what our recipient countries are telling us they want from the multilateral system, their view of the new, new multilateralism. It's not an exhaustive list, but there are four ideas that I want to put in front of you. The first concrete item on the agenda for change demanded by recipients, in our, in our experience, would be in the area of technology transfer. This is one area where EBRD is already experimenting. Over the years, EBRD has worked on a private sector approach to climate change and energy efficiency investments. In the course of this time, we've developed a great deal of technical expertise in establishing and scaling up sustainable energy 
financing facilities. In essence, this is a tool that allows us to structure credit lines to local banks, along with a carefully calibrated incentive structure and energy audits so that the local banks can and will on-lend for energy efficiency and renewable energy loans in their communities. We've actually tested and refined this model now with 80 banks, 19 countries, and they in turn have financed over 55,000 loans for industrial, commercial, and residential energy efficiency projects. But of course, we do know that the demand for this type of financing goes well beyond EBRD's region of operations. Therefore, we're now pursuing a vision to transfer that model and mechanism to partners, both our peer regional development banks and national development banks, who do have the mandate to invest in and operate in other parts of the world. We're fortunate the Global Environment Facility has recognised this demand and has given us the funding to kickstart this approach. We'll provide the technical, technical assistance and the guidance on transferring these tools into the local banking and regulatory environment and partner institutions implement and finance resulting projects. It, but it's interesting that we had to go to the Global Environment Facility to do this because we couldn't, within our own mandate, use our own resources to do this outside of our region, even though we are recognised internationally as having these skills. In the same way, I think EBRD could benefit from very particular forms of expertise that others have developed. Uh, for example, a mechanism for health sector interventions. This is a new area for us in the, in the private sector, particularly in Eastern Europe. And it's very important for us to try and learn from others or bring them in to Eastern Europe to do the job. The second item on the agenda for change for, from recipient countries that want RDBs to maximize their impact and be less concerned with territorial behavior would be to consider creating joint ventures between the regional development banks. Why not find a structure that allows us to collaborate with peers from other institutions in order to translate a solution into a new region and combine our institution's know-how and financing. And an established joint venture structure would give us the flexibility, I believe, to tap into proven, successful tools and staff and financial resources without having to recreate them from scratch in every region. The third item on the wish list of change from the emerging markets that we work with would include the creation at the global level of cross-cutting platforms that bring together expertise on a particular development challenge. This can be another powerful means of collaborating across boundaries. Climate change is perhaps the purest example of a global challenge for which we need all possible road-tested tools available across all regions. And the climate agenda has perhaps made more progress, I would say, than some others in focusing our resources and building the sort of cross-cutting mechanisms, funds, and facilities that we need. And again, Partnerships such as the Global Environment Facility help us appear across geographic barriers and share knowledge, funding and expertise across institutions. But quite interestingly, the same sort of cross-cutting mechanisms are now being devised for infrastructure investments spurred by the G20 recipient countries. So under the Australian G20 presidency, with their focus on addressing global infrastructure gaps, we've been asked very much lead some of the work in this area. The G20 Forum and the infrastructure platforms that will be created as a result have already forged extremely useful partnerships across region, regions, from MDBs to institutional investors to governments and to corporations. We're already seeing concrete results of this cooperation. Multilateral banks got the message loud and clear from infrastructure investors. The problem is not a lack of finance. The problem is that we don't have enough bankable, creditworthy infrastructure projects with transparent procurement practices to invest in. And that's why the multilateral banks have spent the last year creating a new infrastructure project preparation facility uh, or infrastructure funds precisely as a result of these conversations with recipient countries. So there's enormous scope, in my view, for MDBs to look at possibilities following these types of models. All of these models help build flexibility into our multilateral architecture and channels for cl concrete collaboration without abandoning or foregoing the benefits that come from regional specialization. Now my fourth and last item on the agenda for change from the recipient country viewpoint may in fact be the most radical. It's probably the thing I feel in some way most emotional about because it takes me back to my first job in the, in the Ministry of Finance back in Botswana in 1981 to 83. Imagine yourself, I was only a, a young advisor, but imagine yourself to be the finance minister in a recipient country. Donald, of course, was once a finance minister in Rwanda. 
where a number of regional development banks are operating. Each of these banks will need to work up a country strategy that fits its mandate and its skills. You, the finance minister, will want a set of strategies, country strategies from these regional banks for your country that match your long-term development strategy. You'll also want to minimize, frankly, the unnecessary transaction costs that are imposed by all these multilaterals descending on you and asking very similar questions. So why not synchronize the timing of these country strategies? Why not actually aim for one country strategy covering all the regional banks operating in your country, and, but with respect to their different mandates? Why not? Well, because I suspect the vested interests of the different multilaterals makes it difficult to even think about such a nirvana. I would like, before I finish my career in development at least, to see if we can at least pilot uh, such an idea in one country. So my intention tonight has been very much to consider a different frame for the way we think of multilateral development banks and how they can contribute to development priorities. There are no doubt important questions to ask as new MDBs establish themselves in a system that has tried to harmonize its operational and governance standards. But among those questions, I hope we can ask, what are the right skills and approaches these institutions can bring into the mix, and how can we incorporate those into horizontal structures of collaboration? We've, we mustn't, of course, lose sight of the fact that the resources of development banks are still a drop in the ocean compared with the global financial flows and global development needs. But if there's anything in the new multilateralism for me, it's about how to ensure we leverage our institutional knowledge for the global good and in the true interests of our partner recipient countries. And as I said at the beginning, we can only really seize this new agenda if we challenge head on the assumption that business as usual is going to be sufficient. Our countries of operation are already telling us that it isn't. They deserve better. We're doing a good job in my view, but the regional development banks can do an even better job if we respond rapidly to this agenda for change. Thank you very much. I, I, when Susuma's office approached me about hosting him and then we went to President Kabaruka about who more in a moment for this kind of speech, that was in a sense my fantasy of what he would do. Not the specifics, but the fundamental reframing and thinking uh, without regard for the old models, except as a practitioner who's learned some hard-won lessons. And I, I have to say that was an extremely provocative in a good way, fresh thinking for which I think everyone is going to be very grateful. I, I'd now like to turn to President Donald Kabaruka, who, as was mentioned, previously had served as Rwanda's Minister of Finance and Economic Planning prior to 2005. He's currently finishing his term, as mentioned, as president of the African Development Bank and chairman of its board. He's received degrees, including a PhD in Economics from the University of Glasgow, and has obviously been at the center of both recipient and giving issues for the countries in his region. Donald, if you could join us, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. There's very little I disagree with from what uh, Suma has just said brilliantly. The only thing I could add modestly is the following, that I happen to have been Minister of Finance of a very poor country. At the time when Suma was uh, permanent secretary of DFID, which is one of the largest development organizations in the world. And so we had that relationship. At the same time, it's the same relationship with the World Bank and the IMF, ADB and others. Now we, we do the same things. So I have uh, been able to see what I think are the weaknesses in the international system. And as it puts quite well, the resistance to change, which if not addressed, will make the IFIs irrelevant. And I say this with uh, all the candor at my command. Let me, therefore, thank you for inviting me and make just three points. Right now, opening a TV station, a radio station, it is about Ebola. But I cannot imagine any time in recent uh, years when so much money has been spent on the sector of health. In fact, between the year 2000 and 2010, 
the amount of money spent in the health sector was probably five times what has been spent in the preceding 50 years from IFIs, vertical organizations, and many others. But so, how come that between February and July, the world seemed to be confused about Ebola? If you answer that question, you're going to find what is wrong fundamentally in the current system. Uh, what is wrong is that between February and July, we knew there was a problem. For some, it was a problem of Africa and Africans. It never reached our shores. For others, oh, I'm sure someone is handling it. But there's someone handling it where small underfunded organizations, the International Red Cross, Médecins Sans Frontières, Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. But where are the big guns in the world? And I do think that that shows you what the problem is. If there was a system to do with the global commons, or a system which analyzes threats to the world, it would have kicked in. By the way, Ebola was not even declared a global emergency until September. It was treated as a public health issue. Now, I do recall what was said by the President of Chile at the G20 meeting in, uh, in Los Cabos. He said there was an earthquake in Chile, I've forgotten the Richter scale, and there was an earthquake in Haiti at about the same time. But the earthquake in Chile killed fewer people than in Haiti, or well, that was much more serious uh, earthquake, because it attacked the country which had systems. It is the same as Ebola. If this Ebola had begun here in the U.S., it would have been contained. And that's why it was contained in Nigeria, in Senegal. But the three countries of the Mano River, uh, which have been weakened by years of, uh, of civil war, the systems are not in place to respond. And here now is the second weakness of the current system. A lot of the money which has been spent in the health sector over the last decade has been what is known as vertical spending. So money to deal with a disease, HIV AIDS, a disease tuberculosis, a disease, malaria. It worked very well in the sense that it has reduced the number of uh, dying children. It has even cut down the rate of HIV AIDS. But you can see now, suddenly, you have this epidemic and the health system is not able to cope. Second, weakness of the system, <coughs> at least for the health sector. Because for some time there was this uh, naive view that, uh, okay, uh, now that we have vertical foundations, we have got UNAIDS, Gavi, they can handle it. They haven't. We have to go back to square one. But who does that? Who does that must be some international institution within the multilateral context which could act as a glue, you know, putting together all these pieces together so there could be a global response. Now that is happening now. But that is six months later. I believe that uh, what Suma has said reflects also uh, an issue which all of us know, that the current multilateral system is uh, fractured around institutions which are very legitimate but ineffective. Ineffective because of the way membership works. And that's the UN and its organizations. They're legitimate. All of us are equal there. One man, one vote. But the institutions don't have the wherewithal to do what they're supposed to do, precisely because of the way they're structured. Then you have institutions which are very effective, but are considered by many people to be illegitimate, because many countries are locked out. That would be the G20, at least at the beginning. At the beginning, the G20 resolved the global financial crisis. But many African countries were locked out. Many Asian countries were locked out. And so for them, you can resolve this issue, but they are not legitimate organizations. And so what has happened in the world, Pascal Ami, is that something else has developed to fill the void of the failure of multilateral, multilateralism. He calls it plurilateralism. And I don't know how I got this word, but that's what he calls it. 
So you've got a lot of small organizations which have come into feel for the gaps between effectiveness and legitimacy. But they're acting independently of each other. And so when you're confronted with a class like, like Ebola, you have these disjointed, discoordinated responses. I mention this because all these international organizations were meant to deal with the global goods. Uh, and you can see where today that we're still having an issue. The second point I would like to, to mention is uh, Summa, what you mentioned, when the African Development Bank was uh, founded in 1964, according to one of the founders, uh, a delegation came here to the World Bank to see the then president of the World Bank. <laughs> you should see the description of that conversation. They shows the African Development Bank. But we are here at the World Bank. What is you are going to do which we can't do? In any case, the Africans went back and created their own bank. But over time, uh, because these are poor countries, the capital base did not allow them to do what they wanted to do. And so at some point, they approached the rich countries, could you join us so there could be a partnership? Now, that process was very complicated in a sense that, so you have African countries realizing this is a cooperative of the poor countries, but they want the cooperation of rich countries but they don't want to give away their identity. And so there was a debate about, OK, so what is the African character of this institution? So they beat in the Constitution a couple of things. Number one, the president of the African Development Bank will always be an African, even though non-African countries own 40% of the stock. Number two, there will always be a double majority for decisions of major importance. And third, the headquarters will always be on African soil. So the, this kind of arrangements to preserve local identity, at the same time, international cooperation. However, this is another point which uh, Suma is raising. Over time, though, it became clear that the voice of the Africans inside their own bank was not as strong as it could be. And that led to a whole list of frustrations because then the driver of the paradigm of development on the African continent was not internal. It was from outside. In fact, there was a famous report from the World Bank in the early 80s called the Beg Report, called Accelerated Development in Africa, which basically posited <coughs> that what is wrong with African economies is that uh, the market forces have not been allowed to, to function as they should. So get the state out and everything will be fine. Now that influenced the policies for a long, long time. However, come around late 90s, a resistance began to form around that particular paradigm. And so it coincided with geopolitical shifts in the global economic system, and the same African countries began to look at alternative sources of funding. But not only alternative sources of funding, but also alternative development models. This one began to have this criticism of the Washington Consensus. There was something called the Beijing Consensus, others looking for different ideas. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is that if we're going to reform the regional development banks, or even the Washington-based institutions, we have to recognize that the shifts which have occurred in the world are irreversible. Today, uh, if you exclude the countries which are coming out of war or in conflict, the role of international finance in any country, middle income or thereabout, is less than 10%. The rest is financed from internal resources, from sovereign bonds, natural resource bagged contracts with countries like China or Brazil. And so the role of uh, IFIs has declined dramatically. Not only their role in providing resources, but also their role in defining the paradigm of development. Indeed, uh, the late Mele Zenawi, Prime Minister of Ethiopia before he died, he had uh, was about published uh, a manuscript called, it was called uh, 
dead ends <coughs> and new beginnings. The new beginnings had in mind was <coughs> a different development model which is not based on the Washington Consensus, which is not a rejection of the Washington Consensus, but it's not fully based on that model. And uh, we don't have much time to develop that. And so for regional development banks, especially the African Development Bank going forward, they have to be a recognition of three things. A, Africa has changed dramatically in spite of Ebola. And therefore, this institution is now competing with many other sources of funding, but also sources of ideas. That is one. Number two, a recognition that uh, we're 54 countries, some of them fragile state, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and the rest of them, we still require support. Support because uh, of what the economists call the neighborhood effects. What happens in there affects the neighborhood. So there's a role for IFI still in those countries. And so my own hope, uh, Suma, is that going forward, uh, the thought is you have got 54 countries. Some of them are oil exporters, others low income countries, middle income countries. You can go into the taxonomy of your choice. We have to provide a response to each of them reflecting their own needs of today, not their needs of yesterday. Therefore, number one, infrastructure. If we're going to find infrastructure, we now have to go to the capital markets and try to use uh, international resources uh, from IFIs simply for leveraging. This is what we're doing now in the African Development Bank. we we'll put a place a vehicle which basically tries to leverage international resources into infrastructure financing. And by the way, uh, on this issue, um, I must say something which uh, could also be uh, not fatal, but reduce the influence of the IFIs. Think of a country of 20 million people. Energy availability may be uh, 100 uh, megawatts. So if they want to build a dam, a hydro dam that is, they have to go through seven years of hassle. If they want to build a coal power plant, they'll go through the same problems. Many of them therefore have been going through third alternatives. And my fear is sometimes doing it the wrong way, out of frustration. And so I think we have to figure out how to respond to the needs of these countries, recognize that they come from far behind in terms of things like energy availability. Uh, there's a case of a dam in the Congo uh, with a potential of 40,000 megawatts of electricity, which we have not been able to do up to now. There are many reasons, internal and external. But I think as the systems are today, it will be very hard to do it in the speed with which that country expects us to do. There have to be studies on the environment, on social side, so many things. And before you finish the studies, some emerging country has uh, grabbed the contract. That's what happened in Ethiopia. So the clients have changed. The international system has changed itself. And I think we need to perhaps go back to what the Europeans call the principle of subsidiarity. Resolve the problems at the lowest level possible. So strengthen the regional institutions, strengthen sub-regional institutions, and allow the, uh, the global institution to handle these uh, global goods or global bodies like, uh, like Ebola. So, Suma, I think that everything you said I can uh, endorse. In fact, if you could change that speech, you can put my name to be the same. <laughs> but I do think that people should begin to push back and understand that today is not 50 years ago where these institutions were created. The clients are looking for different things. The world is moving on. And I do believe that you have to go back, not simply to resist change, but actually to be ahead of the change ourselves, as we are trying to do with Suma in case of uh, IBRD. Just to give you an example, and I finish. After the Arab Spring in, in North Africa, uh, Suma approached me, or your police, I don't know. Could we work together in North Africa? My immediate answer was yes, because you bring in efforts, you bring in experience from Eastern Europe, so that is relevant here. By the way, 
I even approached the Inter-American Development Bank to say, there's a huge experience in Latin America of how countries transit from military dictatorships to democracies. So there's a huge experience there. But we could not find a formula of ensuring that the Inter-American Development Bank could bring that experience from Latin America, from Brazil, from Chile, from Argentina, to North Africa. We didn't have the instruments. But I agree with Zuma that we should have tried to find the instruments to allow Inter-American to bring that strength in, uh, in North Africa. It could be that we could have something to contribute in Haiti. Who knows? I have to ask my friend uh, Luis Moreno, but I think that perhaps some of our modest experience in Africa might be useful in Bolivia, in Haiti. So I think time has come to uh, sweat the balance sheet of the institutions, work together, because the old model is no longer working. So thank you very much for inviting me, and I agree with everything Suma has said. Thank you. Donald, you may agree with everything Suma said, but you got there by a completely different route, which makes the combination all the more persuasive and which exemplifies the kind of exchange both of you are talking about. And thank you very much for that contribution. I'd now like to turn to my dear colleague, Simon Johnson, for a somewhat more academic but also practitioner's perspective. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Thank you uh, to Suma and Donald for two uh, very powerful and, and I think uh, persuasive speeches. Let me try and, and uh, see if I can put them together and, 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 and perhaps add, add some emphasis or some urgency, because I think you were both speaking as international diplomats, and, and I don't currently have such a constraint. Uh, Suma has asked us to think about refounding uh, our international institutions, and, and, and Donald has emphasized the importance of legitimacy and effectiveness combined. And I think that's exactly what we need to focus on. And let me talk about three refounding moments, two in history and, and one today, and, and how it worked, a little bit about how it worked. The first one is 1944 or 1947 or 1949. We have to remember the big conceptual jump that was taken at the beginning with a lot of American leadership, but many other people participating, including at Bretton Woods, to create what we now call an, the World Bank, but also the other institutions based on some uh, very hard work, some difficult moments. Eugene Black w was asked, uh, how much credit did the World Bank have in 1947? He said, we had none. No one believed in the World Bank. The American market was very skeptical. The task was to take that American investable capital that had got burned in the 1920s, persuade them to invest in rebuilding Europe, use the World Bank as an, as an intermediary for that process, and it worked. It was a remarkable success, one of the most successful innovations uh, in, in, in the history of the international economy. I, I, I love particularly the, 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 um, the concept that we now perhaps, you may take it for granted, you may not even notice it, callable capital. The World Bank at the beginning was based on the idea that you pay, you have a large amount of capital, relatively speaking, subscribed, but you pay in relatively little. And then you if you, things go well, you retain your earnings and you build up a stronger capital base and you can always call on that shareholder capital and when you look at Moody's rankings, for example, of the EBRD and the African Development Bank, both of whom get absolutely stellar uh, ratings for good reasons with sensible analysis based on a lot of transparency from Moody's and others, part of it is there's a big chunk of callable capital, the shareholders are committed, if there's trouble, you can go to the shareholders. It's a good structure, and it doesn't hit the budget up for that much money up front. That was a big issue in 1944, as, as well as today. So I, I speak as somebody who's impressed by the track record and somebody who's, who's a friend of a multilateral approach, including the multilateral banking approach. The second refounding moment is, of course, the EBRD. And there were many people I remember vividly at the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, who were extremely skeptical. Do we need an EBRD? And, and Suma explained that to you. And I think you can look back at the track record now and say, yes, they achieved a lot. They went into markets where no one else would. They designed products that no one else was interested in doing. They took risks. They have some risks on their balance sheet today that we're not discussing. And, and, and that's good. I want you to take risks. Their NPLs have, have gone up since the financial crisis. That's a good thing. They were lending in to the crisis when everyone else was running out the door. That's what we want from multilateral uh, development banks. And the fascinating, fascinating point that Suma alludes to, but I really must stress it, is that the, the, it, was, it was President Mitterrand with Jacques Attali, a lot of French intellectuals uh, in, involved, including my friend Philippe Aguillon as the first chief economist. 
if John William, and, and what do they want? And what does the mandate of the EBRD say, actually, and this is not in the mandate of the World Bank, for good reasons. The mandate of the EBRD says we're about democracy and we're about markets and we're about, frankly, capitalism, private sector development, and, and that's exactly what's got in the DNA of that organization. If only John Williamson had coined the phrase, had, had described it accurately as French socialist consensus of 1991, uh, rather than the Washington consensus, he could have saved us a lot of trouble. Because it's, it's, those are the policies. If you want to think about, if you want to think about fiscal prudence and, 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 and scope for infrastructure investment uh, today, in today's world, if for emerging markets, uh, read uh, Summa's speech, I think it's from March, uh, where he talks about who has fiscal space and who has absorptive capacity, and he has a very nice grid there, and the answer is, in a very measured way, and, and so, so I, I, I'm making this sound too stark, but he says there's one country that has this capacity where this could be a focus. That's how we should, we should be fiscally prudent. We should focus on, on the private sector. What about now? What about this, the, the moment now for refounding? Can we remake our institutions in, in some way to, to address today's problems? Well, I, I think, frankly, we're, we're going to, like it or not. Uh, because the competition is arriving. I mean, everyone is, is being far too polite, including the Chinese vice minister who was just on this stage who was extremely polite. But let me translate into blunt English. Uh, the Chinese are in this business too, and they are going to be lending. I don't know if it's the BRICS Bank or the Asian Infrastructure Bank or some other structure through their external, through their existing uh, financing mechanisms, for example. They are competing in terms of providing finance, providing ideas, big and small. They're in, they're in the business. Um, the World Bank is certainly in the business trying to remake itself. If the multilateral development banks cooperate, as Sumer is proposing and Donald seems open to, that's cooperation. But the big competition you have is the market. Because the market is going to places where they never went before. You can borrow more cheaply in many places, and we can discuss whether that's a good thing or, or not. But that's certainly the availability of credit is, is spreading. And there's both tremendous opportunity, but I would also emphasize uh, Donald's point, which is the, the, the need now is, is incredibly pressing. I, I completely endorse and, 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 and second uh, Donald's point that despite the, 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 the importance of Ebola and the way that's grabbed the headlines, there are many positive changes in terms of economic growth and, and entrepreneurship and real development happening in Africa. We've had a very good 10, 15 years and we want it to continue. At the same time, we must recognize the reality of population and demographics. According to the United Nations, uh, baseline population projection, um, African South Sub-Saharan African population, which is currently just under 1 billion, will be about 2 billion by 2050, and potentially 4 billion by the end of the century. So most of the population growth that you see in, in various ways, most of the children who are going to be arriving in the world in the second half of this century are going to be born in Sub-Saharan Africa. They need capital. They need um, opportunity. We need to think about how this is going to be provided. I think there is a pressing need and a compelling case. I think there's a private sector case. And I like the idea that the EBRD, of all the pieces you're offering, the one that's distinctive, I think, Summa, is the private sector. Connecting to the private sector, obviously there are issues of how you do that, and you've learned a huge amount about that. And, and there's also great material on your website, by the way, about what I liked about the, some of the evaluation material what, was stories that have worked, and, and I, particularly ones that hadn't worked. There was a, there's a great story about a wood, wood processing uh, company investment made by the EBRD, ranked unsuccessful. Just that, unsuccessful. That's what we need a lot more of that transparency, a lot more openness. Share with us more about what's worked and what hasn't. Share it with the client countries so they can see what's out there. They can see the menu. Say, yeah, I want to know, I want to know how we do this kind of investment. Um, I think, that's, I think that that's a, a winning combination. And I'm personally delighted that you've had the opportunity to go into North Africa. I think that's makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure how much, I mean, the label, the first letter in your four letters may not work everywhere in the world. But I, but I hope that the expertise is shared. And I hope that, as Donald says, you've got to construct some mechanisms. Um, and I, I, I strongly believe that we can and should mobilize the private sector as much as possible. I think we should be careful about over leveraging. I think we should be very responsible with our, with our fiscal approach. But we want the private entrepreneurs, we want the private sector, we want the private investment. I prefer an equity financed uh, dimension to that. And I think we want the technical expertise. And I think both of your development, I know that both of your development banks have got very strong record, impressive achievements, and we need more. We probably need more resources also. The combined resources of all the multilateral development banks, including the World Bank Group, are now um, no more than $700 billion. That's including all the big banks. 
that, that, that is not even, that, that's just above being a regional lender in the United States. This is a small amount of capital. The world has grown. That was the success of the 1944 moment. That's the success of the post-Cold War moment, too. The world has grown. The capital flows have grown. We've not increased the official flows. We either have to think about that piece, and, and where do you get the callable capital in today's fiscal environment? That's not so easy. Or we have to think about marrying your technical expertise and social goals and willingness not to go with the cycle, but to go against the cycle, marry that with the private capital. Because the private capital is there, but it's fickle, and we're not sure it can do everything that you need, including the infrastructure investments and including the vital investments in, in, in public health and, and in education. Thank you very much. Simon, that was brilliant as always. Thank you so much. And now, if I could turn to Domenico, who perhaps will up the ante even further into the undiplomatic, or maybe not. But Domenico, please. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. And uh, Adam, thanks for your um, introduction. Let me also say, on behalf uh, of CG that we are delighted about our partnership. It's not just three events that we did together, but I think there is much more and uh, um, uh, certainly a very uh, fruitful partnership from our own viewpoint. So uh, thanks again for, for this opportunity. I have to say that after um, three very distinguished speakers, like the one that have preceded me, it's a little bit difficult uh, you know, to make sense of the time uh, you have allotted. But uh, uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to do a, a, you know I'm going to make a step back and try to put all the remarks uh, and all the points that the previous speakers have made into a broader framework, a broader framework of global governance, which is uh, something you know we focus on at CG um, on a daily basis. And uh, so essentially, what is that uh, you know Suma and Donald uh, have told us that. Uh, you know, the uh, development architecture has become increasingly multi-layered. And this is, uh, you know, a feature of uh, the global economic governance today. It's not just the development architecture, but uh, if you look at the uh, international financial architecture, you also see the, uh, you know, a similar feature. Uh, you know, again, uh, there is um, uh, this increasing multi-layered financial architecture. Uh, you have on the one hand uh, um, central banks that have uh, bilateral relationship swaps. You have at the sub-regional levels, you have the Latin American um, uh, fund, the so-called FLAR. You have other regional organizations and then of course uh, you have at the uh, end of the spectrum the IMF. And at the development uh, finance uh, architecture level, uh, we do uh, observe a similar pattern, a similar uh, trend, although, of course, there are different uh, nuances, and I don't want to discount those. Uh, clearly, there is a bilateral relationship, uh, but there is also a, um, you know, a sub-regional uh, level. Uh, you know, if you take the case of CAF, the um, uh, development bank in the uh, Andean region, uh, this is owned by 16 Latin American countries, a very successful example. Uh, it's a smaller bank, uh, certainly smaller compared, uh, um, you know, to um, the institutions we have been talking so far. But uh, in its own right, uh, it, it, I think the consensus is it has been a very successful institution. And of course, you have, you know, regional uh, regional institutions like the one we have just heard about, uh, um, and then you have the uh, World Bank at the um, end of the spectrum. Uh, what I would say is that. What have we observed recently? Recently, we have observed a further layer. This is the plurilateral layer. And uh, um, what Suma was uh, uh, stressing in his remarks, uh, uh, Donald was also reiterating, uh, you know, essentially there was, there's always this regional, uh, regional dimension that uh, is associated with, uh, um, uh, with this uh, um, uh, development architecture. Uh, but again, uh, this is a feature that we also observed in the international financial architecture. Just to give you an example, um, last year in 2013, uh, the so-called C6, uh, the central banks from the C6, entered into uh, a network of, formalized a network of bilateral uh, swap arrangements. These are the ECB, the Fed, the Bank of Japan, 
the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, and the Swiss National Bank. And I formalized this network essentially uh, based on um, ex ante unlimited drawings, we no strings attached, no conditionality. And again, at the development level, we see a, a similar development in so far we have you know, the BRICS Bank. Uh, so this is not a regional institution and this is certainly um, um, you know, a, a specific feature of this new, of this new initiative. So, um, so why do we have this uh, increasingly multilayered uh, development uh, finance architecture? Um, I think, of course, the traditional reason is uh, that these institutions are ownership enhancing. And I think Suma was saying that uh, in a very elegant and uh, sophisticated way that uh, is typical of a financial diplomat. Uh, um, he was saying that um, uh, you know, there is a geographical mandate that uh, produces a different expertise. And then Donald was saying, was referring to uh, ways in which uh, the African Development Bank, uh, although it is not uh, fully owned by the African countries, can still be a sort of own or the African countries can feel ownership of the institution. You were referring very interesting to this double majority requirement. Um, and of course the location and the nationality of the president. And I have to say that uh, um, you know, if the IMF and the World Bank were to adopt a double majority requirement, I think the uh, gentleman's agreement whereby an American chairs the World Bank and the Western European chairs the IMF uh, would end uh, overnight. Um, so uh, there is this issue of uh, um, uh, you know, um, enhancing ownership. Uh, there is the issue of uh, uh, producing expertise that is relevant uh, for that dimension of membership. Uh, clearly, the World Bank as a global institution may produce a type of expertise that is uh, certainly helpful uh, you know, as a global standard sector, but uh, uh, then you have uh, regional realities that uh, may demand you know, uh, a different source of expertise that is not alternative but is complementary to that provided by a, a global uh, institution. Um, but then I would say uh, we have uh, also two additional stories. And the two addition, these two additional stories, I think, provide a trigger why, uh, you know, we have seen the uh, BRICS Development Bank, uh, uh, you know, established uh, uh, essentially very, very recently and not before. One is that uh, uh, the, latest, uh, the latest events uh, have sort of ended uh, the um, uh, sort of uh, a ratings-driven approach to the governance of these institutions. So uh, the traditional story, and uh, Simon was uh, recalling a very salient aspect of the history of the World Bank. Um, so the traditional story is that uh, the so-called part one countries in the governance of the World Bank, of course, had to have a you know, relatively larger share of the voting power for various reasons. One being that uh, um, the World Bank needs to borrow from capital markets, part one countries have of course access to capital markets, and they uh, not only have access to capital markets, but they have a very, they do so uh, at very good terms. Um, in other words, they have very good ratings. And I think what the latest financial crisis has taught us is that now the new normal is uh, essentially to have a lower rating. And, and therefore, um, you know, the um, uh, sort of presumption that uh, uh, advanced economies, uh, um, uh, because they have a higher rate, should be in the driver's seat, uh, has uh, uh, further uh, lost steam. And uh, uh, you can have, you know, or institutions like uh, the BRICS Bank, you can have other institutions from sort of the south of the world that can be, in principle, uh, financially viable as other um, uh, more mainstream organizations. Um, and then uh, I would also add uh, a, an additional element. Uh, again, this explains the contingency, not the trend, of course. But Adam, you were referring to uh, the difficulty of uh, passing IMF governance reforms. And uh, I mean, we all know where the um, difficulty lies, um, which is not too far from here. But uh, um, I would say, you know, in a way, uh, failure of uh, ratification of the so-called sole package of IMF governance reform goes well beyond the importance, the relevance of the same package. Uh, it goes well beyond that for two uh, essential reasons. First, what was agreed within the G20 was not just um, the so-called sole package in November 2010. What was agreed upon was a trajectory 
of uh, you know, entailing a series of governance reform packages uh, that were, of course, staggered through time. And now we would be discussing essentially the um, subsequent uh, reform package following the Seoul package. Now, all this has been put on ice, uh, to use an understatement, and, and, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, this is much more than just a, a failure of uh, uh, ratifying the Seoul uh, package, and uh, it goes well beyond the IMF. This also applies to other multilateral organizations. As um, Suma, was, Suma was noting, it's difficult uh, to change. Uh, um, there is a bias against change in a treaty-based organization. Uh, I think we all, uh, you know, this is very evident, and I think that the latest uh, uh, episodes, in a way, further point to the difficulty of uh, um, changing, uh, uh, um, maybe you were referring to the policies, but I would also add, it, uh, it adds a further uh, complicating element um, in terms of changing the governance of uh, um, uh, multilateral organizations. Um, and then uh, um, what I would uh, uh, also add is, uh, um, uh, Simon, to get back to your point, you were mentioning the Bretton Woods Conference. Um, uh, what is, uh, I think what is interesting is that when uh, the World Bank, the IMF, were established, it was very clear, especially for the World Bank, of course, uh, for the IMF is even more true, but also for the World Bank, that they were established because in response to a market failure. Uh, in other words, uh, because capital flows would uh, uh, not uh, um, um, you know, flow to uh, developing countries for a number of reasons, uh, it was uh, a right to establish uh, the World Bank to compensate for those failures. And then, of course, this has also been true for the establishment of uh, uh, other uh, multilateral organizations. And paradoxically, what we see now is uh, increasing competition among these uh, institutions that are supposed to um, address uh, some market failures. Um, so uh, there is increasing com competition within these organizations, within the so-called official sector. And again, we are uh, talking about, uh, um, Suma was, was talking about the fact that now the EBRD is uh, operating in areas uh, where traditionally other banks have been active, and this has forced the EBRD to offer a competitive package because clearly the BRD would have never had uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, could not just simply re replicate what other organizations um, um, have already been doing. Um, so this is, so we're seeing increasing comp competition in this official sector segment, and we are also seeing increasing competition vis-a-vis -vis other development players, uh, be them, you know, philanthropists or uh, even, uh, um, you know, capital, uh, uh, capital markets that uh, are now, um, you know, the predominant source of uh, uh, financing for, uh, development, for development economies. So um, just, you know, wrapping up on this, um, what is, so this is certainly, uh, in many ways, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity because uh, there is more room for um, developing knowledge, competence, uh, that is uh, uh, fine-tuned on the needs of uh, uh, you know, various countries, uh, regions, and sub-regions, uh, and groups. Uh, but also, this, is, you know, uh, this provides uh, um, an additional opportunity, because uh, we all know that uh, the gap, the financing gap for uh, financing infrastructures in the developing world is so huge that, of course, uh, in a way, there is not, no real competition because, uh, again, you are really operating in an area where there is a sort of infinite demand, if I may use this term. Um, but what is the, clearly, what is the, uh, you know, the problem looking forward? The problem looking forward is that uh, clearly you end up with a multitude of players and uh, it's not clear how you are going to ensure that the results, um, you know, will uh, always be um, sort of, uh, um, you know, um, um, you're always going to see a net improvement at the aggregate level. And uh, I think there was, uh, um, Donald was uh, um, referring to an important point, you know, at the global level, uh, you have on the one end the UN, which of course is a very legitimate institution, but uh, it is also perceived to lack effectiveness and then at the other extreme, you have the G20, which is perceived as a, 
an effective body, but uh, of course it lacks legitimacy, and in particular, this is in particular true vis a vis African countries, because uh, there are no um, uh, you know, uh, African countries with, with one single exception, of course. Um, so, uh, you know, when, uh, so on the one hand, you want to sort of uh, promote cooperation, um, but at the same time, that cooperation should not produce a result where essentially, uh, you know, you um, sort of avoid the benefits of competition. And uh, just uh, let me give you, uh, you know, so a couple of examples. Uh, it is very well known that uh, uh, the policy uh, framework, the lending framework of the World Bank, um, of course, is, uh, um, uh, is typically perceived to be uh, not so much responsive to uh, the instances, to the uh, needs of uh, a number of uh, uh, borrowing countries. And therefore, you know, this also explains why the BRICS countries have set up their own bank. So uh, again, you, uh, you do want some competition, but at the end of the day, clearly the BRICS Development Bank should be able to set up its own standards in terms of uh, you know, providing uh, the lending uh, to, its member stand, uh, to, its, uh, to its own member, member countries. So it's gonna be a difficult trade-off. I think that no one really, really has the answer uh, to this important question so far. And certainly this is an, you know, an important issue that, uh, um, uh, you know, or about which we'll have to see, uh, we look forward to further research and, uh, you know, further uh, debate uh, uh, in policy circles. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to stop. Adam, thank you very much. And I uh, really appreciate the opportunity of partnering with you uh, today. Thanks. I'd like to invite our four speakers before Domenico sits back down to come up and join us on, on the podium and we can open it up for discussion with the audience. I will just say um, while they're doing that, I'm grateful to Domenico for his two corrections of me. First, that of course the partnership we have with CG involves a lot of exchange intellectually and individually, uh, including home and home visits with their institution and ours and we're grateful for that. But secondly, and far more importantly, uh, he's right. Uh, the, the failure to pass IMF reform is really a problem because it's a failure to make the first step on what is meant to have been a sequence. Um, and that that is a trajectory that would have been put in sort of summa's terms, uh, keeping the institutions more in line with the, with the objective realities. Um, and instead we've let that just diverge further and further. Um, okay, now that we're all seated, unless uh, one of my colleagues, Donald or Suma, wishes to respond to something the discussant said, let's open it up. Uh, we have a traveling mic up front, thanks to Jessica. There's a standing mic at back. Um, if somebody goes to the standing mic, I'll recognize you from there. Jessica, if you wanna give to the lady there in the black sweater, if I'm seeing correctly. Could I ask you to just identify yourself before speaking, please? Uh, sure, I'm Cinnamon Dornsteif. I'm with uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies sites just across the street. I was recently in Manila and had the opportunity to talk with ADB President Nakao. He was talking about collaboration, potential collaboration and partnerships with the new institutions. So the BRICS Development Bank and eventually the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. What he proposed was um, a sharing of policy standards so that if there were to be co-financing between ADB and one of these new institutions that the ADB's policies would have to pre uh, prevail in those kinds of co-financed operations. And I wonder if the um, two presidents of the two regional development banks would care to comment on that proposal. Thank you. Uh, just to note, we, it, it, we've had uh, my friend Mr. Nakao here many times, and it's, it's, we're fortunate to be continuing to complete our set, and uh, we'll keep working our way around all the DBs down to the CAF eventually. Um, Suma, Donald, would you like to say something? Thank you. I, I'll be honest with you. I, think, I don't know if you'll be happy with my answer. Um, I think that in this ecosystem, we need greater competition. Uh, in that competition, in true Schumpeterian ways, maybe some institutions should uh, disappear. And so 
I do think that uh, the BRICS, by the way, I'm disappointed it's a very small bank. Yes. This is my disappointment. I thought the BRICS would come in with a big bank, but they're coming in with a capital at, I think, had a billion dollars, almost our size. And so I'm hoping that they could revise their, their approach. If they want to make a difference, they'll have to increase the capital. No, I think they should bring new thinking into this space. I can tell you we have just created a vehicle in the African Development Bank to do African infrastructure, so what we call Africa 50. Uh, by the way, I agree that uh, we are targeting a rating of A, single A, not the triple A, which we, we have. Someone mentioned the ratings. Good idea. Number two, I'm keen that they have their own policies which respond to the needs of Africa today, but they're not to copy our DNA. And so I think that the BRICS Bank should bring something new to the market, uh, and then let countries, uh, frankly, have a variety of, uh, of things to use from. But if the BRICS Bank became another MDB, I think it would be very frustrating. Yeah. But, but there is a personal view, and uh, I'm not being very diplomatic. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think uh, I'd say, look, there are some things which are easy to share. Um, so environmental, social standards, public information policy, <coughs> things like that. But I think the, the point, if Nakasan made that point, that the ADB standards would prevail, sort of in a way goes to the problem. Um, why have these institutions uh, sprung up? It may be because they think that the existing policy standards, broadly defined, don't really respond to their want, desires, their needs. So um, I think it's like putting the cart before the horse to say one standard should prevail before actually asking them what is it that they found missing in the existing system in, the, in terms of policy standards and seeing whether we can actually shift the system. And that's what we didn't do. We just simply said we're not going to willing to shift. And so they went off and created their own uh, bank. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's, that's a fundamental thing. There are lots of other things we can do like sharing, you know, we, we, do, we try to have this agreement amongst the international banks on pricing in terms of conditions uh, and so on. By the way, that's uh, quite a complicated sort of thing and doesn't work very well. Um, and we found you know, unfair competition. We each accuse each other of behaving badly. Um, but it's actually about the recipient. I mean, this goes back again 30 years ago. My job as a, you know, an economist in the Botswana government, one of my tasks was actually to maximize the grant element in any loan from multilateral. And that's so from a recipient point of view, you want some competition actually between these on pricing. Um, well, I think it would be uh, interesting to also ask, uh, you know, the, the question whether uh, the BRICS Bank would be interested in partnering with the ADB, with the, you know, the, AD, uh, the BRICS Bank uh, new senior management. So I think this is the acid test. But um, generally speaking, um, you know, we, um, across organizations of this type, we can envisage in theory four types of uh, um, sort of relationship. So uh, at the lowest level, uh, you can envisage a sort of coordination based on the mutual exchange of information. And I think this is what's going to happen in the immediate aftermath uh, following the, um, uh, you know, the kickoff of the, of the BRICS Bank, because clearly this is the easiest way of uh, cooperating. Uh, then, uh, you know, if you move one step uh, up, uh, there is uh, uh, subsidiarity. So you tend essentially, um, um, as Donald was mentioning, um, essentially you tend uh, uh, to uh, engage uh, with the um, lowest level that can be effective in tackling a certain challenge or policy issue. And then again, if you move one uh, further step up, that's uh, co-financing, and this is the instance you were referring to, uh, but this would imply uh, consistent standards, as you yourself were, me uh, were mentioning. And therefore, you know, it's a slightly uh, more ambitious level of relationship between the new BRICS Bank and the ADB or any other multilateral organization. And then finally, at the top of, uh, um, of the spectrum, uh, there is a joint financing, which presupposes essentially identical uh, lending frameworks. And just to give you a, a, an idea, this is what uh, uh, has happened in the case of Greece, the other Eurozone countries between uh, the IMF and the uh, European Rescue Funds, and uh, I don't think it is a good idea. 
Simon, if you want to come in or no. Great. Thank you. Uh, at the back mic, please. Hi, um, this is Anna Yukonano from Reuters. Uh, thanks for this uh, fun discussion. It's great to have another perspective um, outside Washington. And I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more about how the World Bank fits into these ideas. Um, you kind of touched on these issues, but the World Bank itself has been trying to reorganize to be more attuned to countries and more efficient and not split up into these silos in different regions, which is a bit of what you're talking about combining the multilateral development banks. So where do you see the kind of World Bank's role, or is it no longer needed? Or maybe its role is just the convening power. Um, and then specifically, you mentioned uh, infrastructure and was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more because there are so many infrastructure initiatives right now springing up. I can't keep track of all the acronyms that I've heard this week. Um, so it would be great to know, as in that particular example, how, how would you cooperate and make sure it's not contradicting with each other? Thank you. Well, I mean, from my point of view, um, uh, the World Bank has uh, two things that uh, are quite unique compared with my institution, maybe other regional institutions. One is a capacity to really t uh, look across all the global issues, global challenges, and link to that um, uh, deep specialist knowledge. Now, they're not the only ones, because I, I would say in EBRD, in some niches within that, we probably have even better knowledge in some areas, but they're niches. But the World Bank has capacity uh, across a much uh, broader set of issues, I think, in terms of specialist knowledge. Therefore, if you put those two together, I think the World Bank could uh, you know, be even more effective if it focused on some of the bigger reform tasks, structural reform tasks, um, than we would. So take EBRD World Bank uh, comparative advantage. I think we tend to be pretty good at scaling up from company level, the companies we work with, on issues around investment climate. because. They, we can actually focus on things that would attract investment, private sector investment into those countries. But we're not so good at thinking through how would you refashion the justice system in a country, which is linked, but it's a broader concept. That's where the World Bank comes in and has much better expertise, frankly, than we do. It's that sort of dividing line that I think we should explore more of. Donald, do you want to? Thank you. I think that uh, uh, the World Bank brings the global reach, which no regional development bank can have. That global reach should be put to good use in terms of the uh, the global commons, whether it's climate, uh, the kind of crisis we are facing now, and so on. But I think uh, time has come maybe not to try to do a small irrigation project in southern Cameroon or in the east of Moldova. I think those should be left to regional organizations. However, the World Bank has also another strength which I think we should try to leverage in that between the IBRD, IFC, IDA, and MIGA, I think bits of those should be now strengthened, become even stronger. Like the multilateral guarantee agency, we need it so that we can do more risky things in these low countries. So, so there are bits of the World Bank which requires strengthening. But I think that where they have to think hard is about IDA, because in the next 10 years, many of the uh, clients of IDA will have uh, graduated, and therefore some thinking will have to be done there. I think there was a paper from CGD which talks about IDA retirement, but I think as IDA retires, I think other bits of the bank can be strengthened, especially at a, at a global level. Same for the international finance cooperation, who is a very good partner. Now, as for whether too many infrastructure initiatives, yes, I agree. Uh, now, should we put all of them in one pool? I don't think so. Again, for the reasons I've just been advancing. Uh, the private markets are looking for competition, are looking for uh, added value here and there. And I think we should not put them together, except, except probably to bring projects to level bankability, uh, reducing them in the early stages. But after that, I think the more the merrier and we've just established one ourselves at the FDB. Thank you. Simon, do you want to come in on this? <coughs> well, I, I think people are frustrated uh, with the World Bank, and competition of the kind we're talking about is healthy. 
So I, I hope personally that the World Bank can respond and rise to this challenge. Uh, but uh, it's going to be a question of who pools knowledge better, who can bring the resources to bear. The World Bank is not as highly leveraged as some of the other multilateral development banks relative to um, its usable capital. There's plenty for the World Bank to do, but you're right that they, they, uh, they are now under some pressure. Uh, Domenico? Uh, um, what I would uh, say in response uh, to you, Anna, is that um, I think there was a time several years ago where many were wondering why we had uh, regional development banks while there was the World Bank. So it was really difficult for the regional development banks to sort of explain you know, their raison d'etre. I think now maybe the pendulum is swinging in the opposite direction. And I think it's easier for the regional de development banks to argue for their own raison d'etre, as we have uh, heard very effectively tonight. And I think it's uh, slightly more difficult to do so for the World Bank, partly because I think uh, discharging its uh, mandate, its global mandate, has become increasingly difficult in a globalized world economy. Because you know, on the one hand, you have this globalizing drive, uh, this globalizing force that is driving the world economy. Uh, and of course, this is something that uh, um, benefits the World Bank as a global institution. But the, the, uh, on the other hand, you also need uh, uh, you know, increasing ability to fine-tune solutions on, uh, uh, based on local needs. And clearly the response cannot simply be uh, to just to delocalize the regional departments and sort of make the World Bank as a sum of uh, regional organizations because then, uh, again, uh, they, they, uh, it would face competition from uh, your own organization. So I think the achieving the World Ma Bank mandate in the current context of increasing competition, of uh, increasing, you know, increasing attention to local needs, regional needs, sub-regional needs, is becoming extremely more challenging. Thank you, Domenico. I'm very conscious of the fact that our two distinguished guests, not to mention our, our brilliant discussants, will have to get to their next events. Um, if they're willing to give us two more minutes, let, uh, let's at least get the statements or questions to the two people waiting patiently at the microphone and then ask if anybody wants to give a quick response. So please. Okay, thank you uh, for your patience. Uh, Peter Backfuss with the International Trade Union Confederation. Um, I, I'd just like to mention one major innovation that uh, the institutions headed by uh, both our distinguished guests have introduced that they, they didn't have time to um, deal with in their speeches, but that, that was the introduction uh, on the part of the EBRD of its uh, performance requirements in 2006, and very recently the African Development Bank with its um, operational safeguards, and they, they established basic um, health and safety, uh, environmental and social standards, and just in the labor field it's interesting that, that I follow closely, of course, um, there's a requirement now that all workers in uh, activities uh, funded by the two institutions have to abide by uh, the ILO's core labor standards, basic, basic health and safety uh, standards, access to, to written information about employment and so on. And the, the question I would like to ask is, um, is, well, again, relative to the World Bank, uh, which is undergoing a process right now of revising its safeguards, it has no labor safeguard. There seems to be a lot of internal resistance to uh, adopting more than very superficial standards. Um, they're can, not coming can, anything can, close I'm to what sorry, your can institutions Can you get that. through a question, please? And the question is, um, how did you, uh, in, in your institutions, uh, be able to overcome the, uh, you know, what uh, Suma described earlier as the bias, uh, bias against change? The, the recognition that these are important things that uh, financial institutions have to do to gain legitimacy as institutions that, uh, that uh, improve the, the welfare of the, the people of the country they serve. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and the lady at the mic, if you could also pose your comment. Yes, I'm Nancy Alexander of the Heinrich Boll Foundation. Um, thanks for your presentations. I just wanted to say that um, in this new vast ecology of infrastructure institutions, uh, one new facet is the requirement for project preparation facilities at all of the multilateral development banks that will work together in new ways on infrastructure and create a pipeline of bankable projects. And in Africa, 
Um, one of the pipelines for bankable projects seems to be called the Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa, or PETA. And we've been working with partners, think tanks, groups all Again, over Africa. Again, could you get to a question, please? Um, to request information about these projects in the pipeline. We've been able to get no transparency, no documentation. None of the African groups have gotten responses from the governance, uh, the three governance institutions of PETA. And it's just a question about how much transparency or consultation is really appropriate in an era where we're moving a lot of money, a lot of projects fast. Okay. May I suggest Donald respond directly to that question, however much he wants to, and then says something about the labor standards, and then we'll turn to Suma on that. Uh, I'm really sorry if you have not been able to get information. It's public, and I'm prepared to engage you after this, uh, give you access, because the PIDA program was adopted by the African heads of state at a summit. And so this is public information. So I'm sorry about that, but I'm happy to be able to correct that, give you access to <clears throat> all the PIDA information you need. Uh, I don't know what's happened, but here I am. I'm making a promise in the public that you can access the PIDA programs. Now, uh, on the safeguards, though, it's true that we work very hard to ensure the safeguards are in place because we believe in human rights, we believe in the protection of the environment, uh, social rights, and so on. But I tell you uh, something I should add. Uh, Chair, I seek your indulgence. Well, no, if you have more time, we have more time. <laughs> <laughs> it is very, very difficult to tell Africans living in darkness that uh, it will take them seven years to build a power plant it's very difficult to tell them that although we have got so much hydropower, developing them takes such a long time. And the result is that children are living in darkness, are studying in the streets under uh, uh, traffic lights. Mothers cannot give their uh, best in good conditions because there are no lights. Uh, Liberia, which is having a crisis, Liberia has only 52 megawatts of electricity. Engineers tell me you cannot run even a small uh, factory. So in a place like that, you have to balance the safeguards we're mentioning, but also the legitimate needs of the population. I think this is where the space often becomes a bit uh, contentious. So I have got to it by compromise, but I hope these things should be dynamically reviewed all the time. Let me just uh, quickly touch on the safeguards uh, question that Peter raised. I mean, there's a, in our board, there's actually quite good consensus, which is why we got to the 2006 uh, policy, if you like. So the interesting issue for me, I think, isn't really about at the institutional level. It's about at the company level. So because we're lending mainly to the private sector, how can we um, convince companies we work with, we finance our partner, cl our clients, that actually it's in their interest to uh, lift their standards, labor standards or other standards, corporate governance standards, plenty of other standards. And it's essentially about making those companies fitter for international investors. So if they want to attract more <coughs> private investment from uh, other countries and so on, um, they need almost to adopt standards which lift that level up. Uh, so it isn't just about EBRD insisting, you know, this is other, otherwise, you know, we can't finance you. It's actually about their long-term uh, health as a company. And that's what's, I think, helped. Now, we, of course, are operating much more in the middle-income country set of things. So we're not facing, I guess, the sharp trade-off that Donald talks about. In my past, in DFID, we did face exactly the same issues. On child labor, for example, you often have this really difficult situation. Now, what do you do about it? Do you refuse, or do you try and help lift standards over time through your investment? That's always a really tricky trade-off that you have to make. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful to President Chakrabadi, President Kabaruka, and their teams. You gave us fully, in an open fashion, in an intellectually engaging fashion, and that dare I say, in a brave fashion, some real meat on how to start thinking about the new multilateralism in practice where so much good can be done. And I'm grateful as well to my close colleague, Simon Johnson, who was fabulous as always, and to our partner, Domenico Lombardi and CG, for helping us make this such an event. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.